on this week's program, Archaeology. Excavation sites, analysis techniques, and conservation methods. Archaeology studies past human societies by unearthing and analyzing the remains left by them in the ground. This work is accomplished by uncovering, gathering, analyzing, and conserving the debris discarded by the human beings who preceded us. In the hustle and bustle of modern life, where we put our feet is hardly a major concern. And yet, unawares, we are walking on a priceless treasure, our past. One of the first steps in an archaeological excavation is diagnosing the site. On a defined area of land, the topsoil is dug up. This preliminary stage, referred to as excavation of the upper soil layer, is usually done with a mechanical shovel. Progress is monitored very closely, and the shovel is stopped the instant an archaeological object or structure appears. As a rule, two meters of the upper soil are removed. When the archaeological richness of the site warrants it, an evaluation phase is undertaken. The perimeter of the excavation is enlarged so as to assess the site's size and state of preservation. Once the upper soil layer has been removed and the site assessed, the excavation proper can begin. As a rule, the first 10 meters of soil are excavated. It is here that the archaeologist discovers tombs, foundations, ovens. To find the traces of the most ancient civilizations, he may decide to dig further down. Shovels are also used to reach the deeper layers. Progress is sometimes hampered by a body of groundwater. When this occurs, concrete walls may be erected to protect the site's richest area. Further research can then proceed in dry soil. As they are discovered, the artifacts are removed from the sediments. This stage is known as excavation of the artifact soil layer. At this stage, a number of precautions must be taken. As a rule, the site is divided into a grid of areas, each measuring one to two square meters. This delimitation of sample zones enables the archaeologist to locate objects meter by meter and to better understand how life was organized on the site. The grid is then reproduced on a series of sheets of scale paper, representing the various layers of the site. With this system, the exact location of every artifact is faithfully reproduced in three dimensions. Most archaeological sites are defined by a superposition of layers of sediment. These formations are the result of the accumulation over time of various mineral particulate matter deposited by water or by the wind. Little by little, these sedimentations buried the traces of ancient human civilizations. The depth of the deposits is generally proportionate to their age, the deepest layers being the oldest. Based on the nature of the layer in which an object is discovered, the specialists can deduce its approximate age. Objects unearthed are sorted by category, ceramics, bones, pieces of wood, and so on. Artifacts that were buried in a humid environment are washed and preserved in water. This treatment prevents them from decaying too quickly on contact with the air. Conversely, objects found in dry environments simply have their earthy gang removed. How well an object has been preserved depends mostly on the environment in which it has lain. For example, acid terrain promotes the degradation of organic matter, such as wood or bones, as well as mineral matter, such as stone. Acidity can be natural in origin, in soils high in granite, for example, or be related to industrial activity. Acid levels are evaluated by pH, a measure of acidity or alkalinity, ranging from 0 to 14. pH values depend on the proportions of hydrogen ion and hydroxyl ion content. 
The former are released into the environment by acids, and the latter by alkaline compounds. When combined in a given environment, each hydrogen ion reacts with a hydroxyl ion to form a water molecule. The pH is equal to 7 when the neutralization is complete. The environment is then said to be neutral. However, if hydrogen ions outnumber hydroxyl ions, the pH will be less than 7, and the environment qualified as acid. When there are more hydroxyl ions, the pH will be higher than 7, and the environment said to be alkaline. In other words, the more acid the environment, the lower its pH. This measure is said to be logarithmic, since a variation of just one degree translates by 10 times weaker or stronger acidity. In nature, the pH of soils ranges between 3.5 and 9.5. Archaeological remains are best preserved in soils that are neither too acid nor too alkaline. Whatever their origin, artifacts all become brittle from their long stay in the earth. They break easily or crumble when handled. Before being analyzed and restored, every object is faithfully drawn. Their exterior appearance, thickness, or any traces of paint on them are all important clues for identifying them. An archaeological dig can last a few days or several years. For the most part, simple instruments are required, such as trowels or picks, as well as an essential human quality, perseverance. Today's archaeologists are scientists. They are knowledgeable about the various fields of study that can further their research. Geology, botany, zoology enable them to describe the environment in which our forebears lived. Physics and chemistry help them analyze and date the evidence recovered. Other less known scientific fields can also be useful. Archaeology is more than unearthing old objects. It also involves collecting data on the chronology of sites and objects, that is to say, on their origins and ages. For this, archaeologists rely on methods based on observation of the remains and the materials that make up their environment. These methods are gentler than radiocarbon dating, which requires the destruction of part of the objects analyzed. Sedimentology is among the indicators used. This science studies sediments, that is the mineral, plant, or animal remains that have accumulated over time and constitute the main part of archaeological sites. Sediments chiefly occur in the form of layers, the deepest generally being the most ancient. The first thing to do is to record these deposits in the field. As the excavation progresses, the archaeologists make stratigraphic readings, recording each layer with precision. The various components of every stratum, such as pebbles or objects left behind by man, are also represented. Stratigraphical observations are rounded out by sediment analyses in the laboratory. A detailed study of the minerals provides information on the soil's deposition and on the climatic conditions that prevailed during sedimentation. Lastly, the archaeologists compare these observations with information sheets to assess the approximate age of the sediment layers. The analysis of plant remains also enable the scientists to go back in time. Paleobotany, the study of plant fossils, yields information on ancient food patterns and enables the scientists to trace the evolution of agricultural practices. Plant fossils have to be studied under the microscope. This is the function of carpology, the study of the structure of seeds according to their shapes and sizes. 
To carpology may be added malacology, the study of mollusk shells. These shells help to retrace the history of landscapes and climates, since mollusks depend closely on the environment in which they live. Depending on the nature of the soil or the degree of humidity, a specific community of mollusks will have established itself. For example, the shores of a river will offer different species than those of a forest environment. However, these approximate clues are not enough to satisfy the curiosity of archaeologists who are intent on dating objects as accurately as possible. To do so, they refer to dendrochronology, that is, the study of the growth rings in trees. Wood was certainly the first material used by man for technological and artistic purposes. A great number of carved wooden objects that were used for building and tool making are found in excavation sites. Dendrochronology is the only technique that will date wood objects to the year and go back to the ancient Neolithic age 7,000 years ago. Wood is a network of dead cells containing sap veins. Sap is produced by the cambium, a living tissue located directly under the bark. Every year, the cambium produces new cells that add a fresh ring of growth to the circumference of the tree trunk. A tree ring is thus formed, visible to the naked eye. The size of these rings depends mostly on climatic and hydrological conditions. In times of drought, the ring will be very narrow. Conversely, a wet year will produce a broad ring. Each ring comprises spring wood and summer wood. The first, light-colored and tender, consists of big canals which allow the sap to surge. Summer wood is denser, darker, and more fibrous. Its role is mainly one of mechanical support. Since summer wood is easy to distinguish from the spring wood of the following year, the sample's annual growth rings can be counted. By counting the rings from the heart of the tree to the last outer ring, formed the year before the tree died, the experts can determine the tree's age when felled. However, the last ring, beneath the bark, must be present. It is also possible to determine the exact year when the tree was cut down. This is done by measuring the thickness of the tree rings and reproducing the measures on a graph. By superposing these sequences to those of other samples that grew at various periods in the same region, the experts can draw up a veritable growth calendar with which they can date the sample accurately. In fact, thanks to sedimentology, carpology, malacology, and dendrochronology. Archaeologists are able to go back through the millennia in most of the sites they study and to reconstruct their own history books. Radioactivity is also put to contribution. The discovery of natural radioactive isotopes have helped develop highly reliable dating techniques. Nuclear irradiation is now also used to conserve wood and stone fragments. One of archaeology's goals is to ensure the conservation of objects for educational and research purposes. Fortunately, a new nuclear technology is making it possible to preserve materials severely damaged by time. Among others, this approach is applied to waterlogged wood. Wood that has remained in a water-saturated environment for centuries suffers less decay than if it had been exposed to the air. Water constitutes a barrier that protects the wood against the oxygen in the air. Deprived of oxygen, 
microorganisms develop more slowly, which slows down the natural decaying process. In addition, being immersed in water protects wood from the repeated cycles of wetting and drying that occur in free air. However, the wood structure is often damaged by its long stay in the water. As soon as the wood is exposed to the air, the water evaporates, causing its cellular structure to collapse. The wood then warps and becomes very fragile. It has to be strengthened. The nuclear method will reinforce the structure of even the most rotted wood. It is only used in severe cases of decay because its effects are irreversible, something that, as a rule, goes against the ethics of restoration. Most waterlogged wood begins to decay on the surface. The surface is indeed a fragile area, open to insect and microorganism attack. Microorganisms finally reach the core of the object its oldest and hardest part. To stop this process, the object is immersed in a series of acetone baths for several weeks or even months at a time. During this time, the acetone gradually takes the water's place and destroys the microorganisms in the wood. Moreover, the solvent prevents the object from drying out, and hence from warping. The object is then submerged in a liquid resin, which in turn replaces the acetone. The resin hardens under the effect of ionizing radiation used to consolidate the piece. This process takes place in an irradiation chamber or cell. The radioactive source, initially stored in a pool for safety reasons, is moved by cart. It is guided toward the cell by remote control. The object to be treated is then placed next to bars of cobalt-60 for 24 to 36 hours. Cobalt-60 is a radio element that generates gamma rays of the same nature as light, but of far greater energy. Gamma rays will go through many thicknesses of wood, but do not have enough energy to make the irradiated matter radioactive. Cobalt-60 does not exist in nature. It is obtained from a natural, non-radioactive source, cobalt-59. When bombarded by neutrons, the nucleus of the cobalt-59 gains a neutron and turns into radioactive cobalt-60. The new element thus formed will attempt to return to a stable state, as nickel-60. During this nuclear reaction, each atom of cobalt-60 releases an electron and emits two photons. The two photons create the gamma rays used in the conservation method. The choice of resin is crucial since it is what will determine the object's ultimate resistance. The category of resins best suited to nuclear treatment is composed of two products, styrene, which acts as a solvent, and a polyester. Upon irradiation, the gamma rays trigger a reaction between these two substances. The styrene molecules then create bridges between the polyester chains. It is this chemical occurrence called cross-linking that causes the resin to solidify. At this stage, the consolidation treatment is definitively completed. After final restoration, the piece may be exhibited. This treatment can also be applied to stone objects. The deterioration of stone artifacts often has to do with the migration of water inside the stone. The water drains out soluble salt that crystallize on the stone's surface, damaging the relief of the object. 
To make the damaged area more cohesive, the experts fill the pores of the stone with a liquid resin that will be hardened by gamma radiation. In restoration, gamma radiation is used to preserve certain objects and especially to decontaminate dry wood. A single exposure to gamma radiation destroys any insects and microorganisms in the wood. The nuclear technique brings an inventive solution to the serious problem of the defacement of archaeological objects. It makes it possible to preserve artifacts that would otherwise be doomed to oblivion. Archaeology is becoming less romantic and increasingly scientific. It is a far cry from the mysteries of masked mummies and the adventures of Indiana Jones.